Greetings from LA, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with our journeys, our discussions, our discoveries, and our explorations with respect to the recent releases made by the Criterion Collection during this year of 2024. And specifically, I'd like to focus our attention, if I may, my dear friends, on a wonderful set, a multi-disc Blu-ray set, which we have already been discussing on this channel. And so I'd like to continue those discussions, if you don't mind. Uh, the set that I'm referring to is this, which is Chantal Ackermann Masterpieces 1968 to 1978, which collectively is designated by Criterion at spy number 1203. Uh, today, I'd like to focus our attention, if I may, on one specific work that is found within this set. Uh, it is found on Blu-ray disc number one. Uh, this is a work which is described as being from the year 1973. And the filmmakers are uh, Chantal Ackermann and Sami uh, Slingerbaum. And the name of the work is, once again, please pardon me for my poor pronunciation of the language. I hope you can forgive me. But the name of the work is Le Pins Wheat. <music> This is the work, another very thought-provoking work, uh, and this time it is from uh, the artists and filmmakers uh, that are credited, uh, Chantal Ackermann and Sami uh, Slingerbaum, and they're also credited as editors and also the camera, uh, so Slingerbaum and Ackermann, uh, which is noted also in the context of the essay, the little essay that's included in the Criterion booklet, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later in this video. Uh, so, uh, But this work is uh, described as being from the year 1973, and it features uh, Chris Milikoski, uh, as a young woman, we understand uh, she is a young Finnish woman in a an apartment in Paris or visiting uh, Paris in, uh, in an apartment. We understand is an acquaintance's apartment, uh, and we have uh, in this work uh, focusing in on her and her thoughts as well as her actions and activities in this space, and kind of day in the life of cinema portrait. That is uh, very thought-provoking in a number of ways that I'll try to touch upon in this video discussion. The work in question uh, here is, and please, uh, once again, please pardon me for my poor pronunciation of the language. I hope you can forgive me. But this is Le Quinze Huit. Uh, and uh, I understand also from, among other things, I understand uh, based upon uh, one of the other supplements in this Criterion release, uh, that being the discussion with, uh, the great discussion with B. Ruby Rich about the works of Chantal Ackermann, uh, we understand that uh, this work is Le uh, Cannes or 158, uh, and that it could be a reference to August 15th. And that could be a reference to, again, a day in the life of, uh, and in this case, uh, this figure, uh, this woman uh, from uh, who's visiting from Finland, uh, who is uh, Chris Milakowski. This is a very fascinating film, and in many ways, I think, very similar to uh, past works of Chantal Ackermann as well as making its own distinction uh, in the context of the filmography of Chantal Ackermann. And I think one way to try to describe it is to uh, delve into what the film is or, or the story structure or the presentation structure of it. Uh, we, uh, we meet a young woman who is in uh, a, an apartment, uh, we understand, based upon um, the uh, some of the, the dialogue or some of the uh, uh, narration that we hear from her, which is in the English language, by the way, uh, in a very interesting uh, tone of voice, which we'll get to as well later in this video, uh, which we can associate as being her voice, although we never see, at least to my understanding, we never see actual uh, speaking out loud, so to speak. We see images of her in various situations in the apartment. She is by herself, um, or at least the, the shots that we have of her are of her by herself within the frame. And then we hear over 
uh, the images in the soundtrack, a type of voiceover narration of a woman's voice that we assume or that we can associate uh, as being her voice. And it is uh, a voice speaking in the English language. Uh, so we have an interesting juxtaposition of say, moments where the young woman is seen in the apartment, uh, again, alone, and we understand from uh, little glimpses and uh, bits from the uh, voiceover narration that she is visiting uh, from Finland and that uh, she has uh, been studying the language, maybe having some uh, interesting encounters with other people from the city, other um, uh, Parisians or other people, um, uh, acquaintances and the like. Sometimes there are moments where there's some connections. Uh, other times there are moments where there might be a kind of language barrier, as well as feeling somewhat out of place, maybe feeling homesick, feeling away from home, and the like. Um, uh, while seeing images on screen that may or may not be said to be directly associated with what we are hearing uh, in the voiceover narration. So, for instance, some of the images we do see are of the young woman sitting at a table. There is a long baguette. Uh, so we see her uh, eating a little bit of the baguette bread, for instance. There might be some instances where she's standing on the balcony of the apartment outside, but then turning her head and looking back at uh, what we understand is the camera. She acknowledges the camera. She sees directly into the camera on a lot of occasions. She's uh, maybe in other shots sitting in a, a specifically designated area by the window, for instance, so the camera can capture maybe in medium shot or close up. Uh, her uh, her uh, figure and her face. Uh, sometimes she's looking directly in the camera in a very tight close-up, sometimes even smiling uh, and acknowledging with her gaze, her eyesight, or her eyeline being directly towards us as we are watching. So uh, there are those aspects, as well as seeing her, especially in the opening credits of the film, uh, seeing her framed within a kind of doorway space uh, as she is uh, sometimes in focus, but then maybe steadily drawn out of focus, but also engaged in what one might call certain activities or rituals, maybe in certain rooms like the kitchen, or maybe laying out clothes uh, and her uh, and her packing uh, in a somewhat later part of the film uh, in on what seems to be a bed in the bedroom, etc. Uh, so there are certain ritualistic aspects and uh, being alone or being f uh, shot in a sort of solitary uh, state uh, in uh, this apartment uh, herself uh, with a kind of a monologue uh, that is uh, on the soundtrack, which already, I think, has uh, some very direct uh, linkages with an earlier uh, Chantal Ackermann work, which is called Sot Ma Ville, which was what we've spoken about a little bit uh, in a previous video. Um, and uh, there are some, I think, linkages that one can make uh, with other films like, say, La Chambre, which is also a film about, or could be said about a young woman in an apartment room by herself uh, with certain objects that surround her, her engagement with the objects, food being one such example. In that instance, it was an apple being eaten at one point of the film. Here we have, uh, in this film, um, uh, uh, 58 or pounds wheat, we have uh, a baguette being eaten at one point in the film. Uh, and so uh, uh, the gaze, however, is something that is uh, maybe on and off. Sometimes the young woman in this work might be seen uh, not s uh, uh, directing her gaze directly at the camera, but oftentimes she does direct her gaze at the camera. So that is also something that we see similar to, say, the previous work, La Chambre, for instance, where in that work, as we recall, uh, Chantal Ackerman herself who features in that one was looking right into the camera even as the camera was was uh, swinging uh, in one direction and the other uh, so there are already some connecting points uh, as well as to the, uh, the the way in which environments and settings are treated uh, and the way that uh, the situations are juxtaposed with what we are hearing on the soundtrack now one of the I mean there are many fascinating things about this but one of the fascinating things about this uh, work is how um, uh, how seemingly at first disjointed some of the voiceover is it is uh, apparent that a lot of the things that are spoken of it's maybe it could be said to be in a type of I don't want to say stream of conscious that might be too extreme of a, an expression to use here but it does jump from say 
anecdote to anecdote. We do, at least when I watch the film, you know, I have no background or context as to who uh, this woman is. Uh, I am meeting her for the first time when I'm watching this film uh, every time, and so uh, I only know her from what I hear on the soundtrack and the voiceover and what she's telling us. And so what I do hear oftentimes is there are some moments of the film where she talks about, say, what she plans to do for that day, which is kind of opening part. There, uh, there's a moment too when she mentions uh, the name Chantal, so that also is a kind of meta reference to one of the filmmakers who was involved, who is of course Chantal Ackermann. And then there are other parts of the dialogue as the film progresses where uh, we might hear her speak uh, about, say, an interaction she had with um, uh, maybe some other uh, people, some other men in her life. Uh, there's a mentioning of someone named Pierre. There's also someone uh, who's mentioned named Jean Luc. We never see who those people are, uh, but there is a suggestion of maybe a, a you know boyfriend girlfriend relationship between her and those men that she's mentioning, or maybe not. We're not quite sure, but there is some kind of relationship that uh, relationships that are mentioned outside of the context of what we are directly seeing in the world of the film, which is of course uh, maybe also uh, highlighting or uh, linking back to a similar type of uh, stylistic device in terms of use of dialogue that we saw in a work like, say, um, uh, L'Enfant d'Aimé, ou Je joue à être une femme mariée, uh, the second film in this uh, in Blu-ray disc number one uh, from Chantal Ackermann. Uh, so uh, there is a hint of some kind of life beyond the frame, uh, which is also expressed in other anecdotes throughout the film, such as uh, sometimes she's talking about an encounter. She speaks one time about uh, going to the uh, Paris Metro, uh, the uh, the mass transit system, and talking about a, a almost a, a kind of a very violent or potentially violent encounter she had with a stranger, or recounting this about her um, uh, being violently pulled and attacked, maybe even uh, uh, almost nearly assaulted, uh, and that she even now felt the pain in her arm from being uh, grabbed in that way uh, quite against her will. So she does mention uh, anecdotes like this. She also mentions anecdotes where she is struggling with the language. She acknowledges certain points where she's struggling with the language. She's mentioning how she was uh, uh, approached one day uh, about uh, what she was doing, and all she could say in the French language was the word l'école, uh, uh, or something to that effect, you know, school or studying, uh, in relation thereto. Uh, and then she, her dialogue then also drifts to other aspects of, of, of uh, say, uh, her experience uh, coming from uh, Finland visiting Paris or Paris, uh, talking about how she had a number of friends uh, from many different countries when she was in Finland, and maybe now in Paris she is expressing in some aspects of her dialogue points where she's feeling somewhat, or she, it, the suggestion I think is very strong that she's feeling somewhat al alone or isolated, uh, not quite knowing what to do. Uh, there's a moment too where she talks about, we don't see her enacting this uh, out loud um, in, in, in a physical action, uh, but we do hear her dialogue about, or her her voiceover about how she was having trouble um, uh, turning on the gas uh, in terms of uh, some kind of appliance in in you know the the house or the apartment etc. Uh, so there are moments where she in her dialogue she is expressing on the one hand a kind of uh, vivacious life uh, on the one hand, but also expressing moments of uh, maybe. Uh, a doubt and self-doubt and, and uh, confusion and not quite being sure what to do as well as feeling at some points threatened such as some of these external th threats like some of the um uh, the anecdotes that she recounts in relation to her her experiences on the metro, for instance, um, and then also uh, her travels and how the travels might be a reminder of of just how alone and isolated she and and lonely she feels right now at the moment. There's some mentions to a Virginia Woolf, uh, uh, mentioning to of uh, trips to. Uh, time in London uh, and the like. And so uh, the, it is a dialogue that is, I think, it is very much uh, heavily uh, personalized, one can say, and it does follow a stream or set of routes that might be um, not so wholly, how should I put it, linear in the sense that it follows directly from a kind of introduction to A, B, C, or D. It does go, for, it does jump from point to point to point. Uh, in a way that it could be described on the one hand as being haphazard, it also could be described as being very much a um, 
um, uh, yes, for lack of a better phrase, a type of stream of consciousness way. I, I maybe suggested that that might have been an extreme uh, term to use in this instance. But the more I think about it, the more I, I can see that being applicable here, because it does seem to be something of a free form expression of th certain thoughts at a given moment in time. Now, this is, I think, a very important way for me anyway to try to describe it. In other words, uh, her uh, voiceover is an expression of a type of inner monologue, that which she is feeling at the moment. So, um, if that's the case, then this this is already running a counter to or antithetical to a lot of the experiences that she herself is is uh, saying that she has has um, had while she's staying in Paris. You know, uh, not all, but a lot of the tenor of the anecdote that she's uh, recounting here do suggest a type of uh, solitude or isolation or loneliness. Uh, and if that's the case, then uh, it it is actually even more powerful that despite that sense of loneliness uh, that is recounted in a number of the anecdotes, she is still able via the cinema of um, uh, Slingerbaum and uh, Ackermann uh, to be able to give voice. You know, I mean, the, 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 the fact that she is maybe in a sense of uh, loneliness or isolation makes the point of her giving uh, her uh, voice being given this um, uh, intimate shining light, the ability to say something that she is uh, her innermost thoughts, I think makes that even more powerful. Uh, so that's uh, one thing. It does remind me, uh, too, of how voiceover is used in past Ackermann works and how that could be maybe a reflection of in those works, like uh, 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 L'Enfant d'Amé, uh, uh, Où je joue à être une femme mariée, how the woman there, uh, Claire Walkins, uh, uh, how she uh, maybe was voicing uh, certain aspects that could be said to be uh, self-deprecating uh, indications of a kind of uh, externalized uh, oppressive force upon her, or maybe it was a real authentic uh, opportunity for expressing her innermost thoughts at a given moment. So I think that type of interplay could also be said to be at, at work with uh, uh, the voiceover that we find here with Chris Milikowski. You know, the, the things that she is uh, expressing here in her anecdotes do suggest a type of oppressive environment in certain points of view, especially given one of the anecdotes where she is uh, accounting a near, being nearly uh, violently accosted at one point. Um, so that does suggest a type of external force applying a kind of uh, oppressive nature. That being said, this is also the opportunity for her to voice uh, her own thoughts or her own feelings. At least that's the idea or concept here. So uh, if that's the case, then uh, that I think is a really uh, wonderfully uh, constructed paradox uh, that uh, is, I think, part and parcel with the type of cinema that is uh, very much uh, uh, embedded within the uh, cinematic philosophy of uh, Ackerman, here being, uh, of course, uh, Ackerman and uh, Slingerbaum. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Also, another thing to keep in mind, too, is that there there is a way in which the camera, the position of the camera, is also contributing to the um, to the discussion of of, of uh, subjectivity and objectivity in the uh, form of uh, Ackermann cinema here, Ackermann Slingerbaum. Uh, so uh, we see the camera gazing at this woman. Uh, is it a, is it a means by which the camera, therefore us, are we through the camera objectifying this woman, or is the camera somehow or another uh, uh, giving room for her to express herself in a way that she's otherwise unable to express. Now, that I think is a, a, a very dynamic uh, uh, push and pull uh, type of conversation or discussion point that is very relevant or apropos to Le, Le Pen's suite. So uh, it's a, I think, a really uh, another indication of, uh, of how the Ackerman uh, philosophy or cinematic philosophy approach is at, at play here. I think also uh, it's very important to keep in mind too that the much like uh, other works, um, there is, I think, undeniably a type of warmth and intimacy uh, through the gaze that uh, uh, is ventured through, uh, thanks to the cameras and its positioning. I mean, um, it is a. It, it seems to be, especially in the care in which we understand the the dialogue or the voiceover uh, given uh, being given prominence, uh, we can therefore glean from that. Uh, that the camera itself is not antithetical to that, but perhaps it is very much in conjunction with that. In other words, the care that is given to give voice to this young woman via the dialogue can also be said to be shining light on the care that one can see, uh, one can interpret uh, by association. 
uh, with the lens of the camera. So okay, there's care visually and there's care audibly, uh, in a manner of speaking. And so if that's the case, that one can say that maybe the depiction of the woman or the position of the camera is indeed a, a positive force rather than a, uh, a, a destructive force for you know using uh, extreme uh, um, uh, descriptors as examples. Uh, I, another thing too, uh, uh, maybe I should uh, take a step back and say one thing that does uh, one can say that does distinguish this work from, say, other past Akerman works is the sound palette. Now, we have to remember that this uh, voiceover is given in the English language, and it's also given in a, in a very interesting, uh, sometimes slowly drawn out uh, tone of voice, which I think has a, a very powerful um, a hypnotic way. I mean, it gets some, I think, it, it, there's a, a moment where my ear needed to get used to the sort of the, the, the cadences and rhythms of the voice and the voice pattern uh, at, at first. But once I got into it, which was maybe a few minutes into the film, then it really became its own uh, kind of uh, uh, like sea waves, so to speak. And there's a sort of undulation to the uh, inflections of the voice that I think is, is very... Uh, um, it, it's an, an interesting, very soothing and very calming. Um, and also it makes us, it makes me anyway, uh, it invites me to either take very uh, uh, careful consideration into the specificity of the words that she chooses to say as she's saying something, or there's a kind of, of uh, you, there's a way in which it, it becomes this, this hum. And depending on your point of view and your feeling and your mood as you watch the film, you might feel like you are listening to each word or hanging on every word, or maybe on other occasions when you rewatch the film, the, the words might wash over because it feels like a kind of musical beat or tone, and it becomes therefore this pulse rather than focusing in on the words. Now, I don't mean that in any negative connotation. I mean that very positively because that, I think, goes very much hand in hand with the way that sound and image are juxtaposed here. I mean, sometimes you might say that there is a very uh, close linkage between the words that are actually spoken and the images that we actually see. But other times, and in fact, one might say perhaps most of the time, one can also view the words that is being spoken as being quite different or quite starkly different from the images that we see. Case in point, early on in the film, uh, there is a moment where, she, as I mentioned, she's on the balcony and then looking back towards the camera, which is inside in one of the inner rooms. And at the same time, there's a moment where she's talking about how uh, there were, you know, she had many friends uh, back in, uh, in back in Finland, back home, uh, and so uh, one can look at this as being maybe uh, uh, the words and images being. Uh, kind of uh, uh, in sync with each other because she's outside or she's seen outside looking outside there's a kind of sense of liberation associated with out with the outdoors especially when you have a lot of the interior shots that occupy the the or, or dominate the, the the running time of the film uh, so there's a sense of liberation uh, and freedom uh, that is that's visually associated with the, the visual motif of the outside of the outdoors that also could be said to be kind of uh, uh, emotionally liberating in terms of uh, uh, recalling good times or good memories uh, of friends back home. So that could be some kind of strong association. However, at the same time, there could be a disassociation between uh, what's being spoken and what's being said because she is still framed at this very moment alone and isolated and by herself. So it seems like a contradiction that she is saying, talking about her friends uh, over the soundtrack while she is seen visually alone in Paris, in a, in a Paris apartment somewhere by herself. So that is an example of uh, kind of a, uh, uh, seemingly contradictory interpretations of a singular moment uh, that can happen at the very same instant, that can coexist at the same time. And also it's an indication too of what I was saying earlier about how I can view this film or how perhaps I can suggest that one might view, be able to view this film in uh, uh, either as trying to see or catch how congruent the words and images are or seeing how they are very much disassociated with each other, in which case uh, we have almost the disembodied words and the disembodied uh, image, but we can still uh, handle them in their own way. Perhaps when we look at the disembodied images, uh, we can therefore consider the words as a type of musical hum rather than the words themselves. So that's what I was referring to when I when I say that sometimes when I watch this, I can hear the words and hang on every word itself. Other times when I watch the film, I can feel the, the, the um, I can feel the words as a type of a beat, but I don't necessarily hang on every word. So 
Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with the 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 tone and speed of the voice and the the cadences of the voice, which I think is uh, actually one of the great strengths of this uh, work, as well as uh, um, also venturing into uh, the English language in terms of uh, some, uh, a work like uh, like this, which is not something that we have seen in any of the prior works uh, that we've seen up to date, uh, up to now in the Ackermann uh, masterpieces set here. They've either been silent or uh, uh, speaking uh, a language that is not English. So uh, this is uh, an interesting change or development in that direction. Um, uh, there's also uh, ways in which the camera does linger on uh, parts of the body, the face, or uh, other parts of the body, like the back of the woman, etc. Uh, and one can also question or query uh, to what extent this is an objectification or to what extent this is an intimate uh, uh, maybe connection uh, between uh, the spectator and uh, uh, the person who uh, is um, the subject of the uh, uh, spectating. Uh, and this also leads to another conversation about the gaze, the look. Now, the one, uh, I think one of the things that we have begun to recognize in the world of Ackermann, uh, here Ackermann and, and um, uh, Slingerbaum, of course, but uh, in the world of Ackermann, we understand that uh, the gaze, the look, uh, whether uh, one looks at someone else or one character looks at someone else, maybe there's a, a passing glance at the camera itself, or maybe there's a direct purposeful glance at the camera, such as La Chambre. We understand that the gaze is very important because it calls attention to the fact that, among other things, we as viewers are gazing at something. Uh, and that might lead to, again, uh, very directly, kind of subjectivity, objectivity, uh, positionings of gender roles, uh, de depictions of women, uh, in cinema uh, and uh, and and um, uh, and sort of the the feminist critique, uh, so this becomes I think a very key component uh, of this work, Le uh, Tan Suite, because there are moments where she is looking directly at us. Uh, there's a key moment where the close up of the young woman is uh, quite undeniable, and and uh, the gaze. Um, looking directly at us and smiling at some point. So there's a moment where this gaze is not uh, one that is maybe um, uh, trying to uh, uh, maybe uh, embarrass or cause shame, but on the contrary, it's inviting, uh, one can say, and it is uh, very much uh, maybe uh, uh, welcoming and uh, hoping uh, to accept. Uh, so there's this uh, very uh, wonderful, uncanny way of a type of, of uh, uh, connection between the viewer, the spectator, and the person that is being watched while we are watching the film. So uh, it crosses that boundary of the film. Uh, you know, I'm watch as I mentioned earlier, I'm watching a film in 2024 of a film that was made uh, in the early 1970s, but still uh, that connection is being made. So that, that kind of inviting aspect of, uh, of this, the subject of the spectator I think is one of the key moments of Chantal Ackerman's uh, cinema philosophy. I mean, it's suggestive of the fact that, yes, there is the gaze, there is objectification, but also there is a kind of intimacy that is involved in that. And so uh, the actual act of looking uh, becomes such an important uh, foundational tool. And um, uh, not just uh, the act of looking one direction, but it's bi-directional. So uh, it, uh, it, it, it becomes uh, quite, a, right, it's, it's one of the, uh, the ultimate ways of connecting. Uh, and, and more and more, I re come to realize that uh, Chantal Ackerman's world and Chantal Ackerman's approach is, is oftentimes about uh, connections or about uh, connections, either connections between people and people through the gaze or through the look, or sometimes between people and objects. And uh, that, uh, the, the sort of ritualistic aspect, or maybe the, the, uh, the quasi or direct uh, uh, capitalistic uh, impulses of uh, modern day society, at least when the films were made. And so we do see some of this as well in a lot of the objects that the young woman is seen uh, engaging with the baguette I mentioned earlier, the opening credits in terms of, of being in the room uh, through the doorway I mentioned earlier, which the doorway framing is also seeing how uh, geometric lines and, ge and um, architecture affects uh, personal space, a la a film like Hotel Monterey earlier. That's also very interesting. And also uh, objects, uh, going back to the idea of objects, uh, the way that the luggage and the, the clothes are spread out, etc., uh, on the bed uh, and the like. So uh, I, I think, um, uh, and it's also too important too that even objects are voiced. You know, she talks about a Virginia Woolf book. Uh, you know, she, she talks about sort of other types of objects in her 
in her voiceover narration. But at the same time, she also uh, gives voice to her emotional and psychological uh, uh, points of view and feelings. And oftentimes, as I say, associated with a sense of loneliness and isolation, but also a sense of maybe unknown and also trying to meet other people. Um, and uh, what, what her life in Paris is like or what we can assume it is based on what we see and what we hear. So another uh, really quite uh, 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 thought-provoking work, uh, this time from Chantal Ackerman and Sami Slingerbaum, and this is the work which is Le Quinze Huit. Uh, Le Quinze Huit, 15-8, uh, uh, is a work which is found in this set, Chantal Ackerman, Masterpieces, 1968 to 1978. It is found on Blu-ray disc number one, so by my if that's the first, second, third, fourth, it's the fifth film, and is found uh, on Blu-ray disc number one. Um, and there are no uh, Le Canzuit specific supplements uh, associated with this, but there are some mentionings of the work Le Canzuit elsewhere. Uh, we'll talk about, for instance, another uh, uh, comprehensive supplement uh, when we get to uh, the Be Ruby Rich uh, discussion. That's also a supplement on Blu-ray disc number one, for instance. Uh, uh, but for instance, in uh, the Be Ruby Rich uh, discussion, there is a mention specifically of, of uh, Le Cannes Wheat, 15-8, uh, August 15th, the reference being according to Be Ruby Rich, which is also, I think, an interesting uh, way of interpreting this as a day in the life of uh, this young woman. So. Uh, and uh, so, so, uh, but just going back here, uh, when you go to the Blu-ray menu of Blu-ray disc number one and you press uh, Le Quinze Huit or you select this film, that'll take you to the film. There aren't any, to my understanding anyway, any um, uh, uh, film-specific supplements here. Uh, but that's okay because we have, among other things, uh, two, the booklet and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the small essay, or not small, but the mini essay, uh, which is found on page 23. The section on the film is uh, pages 22 and 23 with information about the uh, crew and uh, the write-up. Another brilliant uh, little essay. I say little. I mean, it's a great essay. It's uh, it's uh, it's a a, a a short essay, uh, but it's not just a synopsis. But it's a critical essay again. Uh, Beatrice Loza, uh, who also provided the comprehensive essay in the book, which we'll talk about in a separate video. But uh, for purposes of the Cans, we uh, the essay here is it's uh, making reference to, um, uh, for instance, Chantal Ackerman and uh, Shanto Ackerman's return to Europe, uh, and maybe uh, the loneliness and isolation that is expressed uh, in uh, by this young woman in this film could be said to be maybe a reflection on Chantal Ackerman's own feelings of maybe homesickness and being away from home, a kind of, of despondency and sadness that could be associated with that as well. Uh, despondency, sadness, uh, feeling out of place or feeling uh, alone or isolated, uh, which is, I think, uh, um, uh, a very uh, a well uh, uh, it's a it's a, a point that's well well taken in the write-up and so an example of where this essay I think shines and excels as do all the other essays here I and mean, this is really really great um, <clears throat> as well as the uh, a brief mentioning of uh, Sami uh, Singerbaum and the context of uh, his professional and artistic relationship with um, uh, Chantal Ackermann and how this in the context of uh, Ackermann's filmography uh, and the, the set here is the only co-directed uh, film that we have here so it's interesting to note here uh, what's noted in the essay about uh, Sundarbaum's uh, future uh, artistic relationship uh, with another uh, Chantal Ackermann works um, so uh, very interesting indeed and so we have another great write-up here, uh, so please check it out if you can. I should also point out for the booklet that, uh, with respect to the presentation, uh, on page 42, it does say, it does indicate that the restoration was uh, carried out or undertaken by Cinematheque, Royal Film Archive of, Be of uh, Belgium, excuse me. And then uh, it also says in the second paragraph uh, on page 42, about one, two, three, four, five, six seven lines down from the top at the very end of the seventh line it says for le quinze uh, for uh, 158 a 16 millimeter duplicate negative and positive print were scanned in 2k resolution with the original monaural soundtrack remastered from a 16 millimeter optical soundtrack positive so uh, again uh, to my eyes and ears this looks uh, really quite uh, quite good indeed you know I must uh, admit that of the all the Chantal Ackermann films 
that are included in this set. I think Le Canzuit is the one that I am least experienced with, so it's the one that I've seen the least. Uh, so uh, my knowledge base in terms of how it might have looked in previous iterations or previous releases is is uh, is uh, quite uh, quite uh, uh, limited or it's uh, non-existent. So I am relying on what I see here with the Criterion release. But what I do see is uh, quite effective, and it, there is a, a the 16 millimeter aesthetic and style, which is I think well preserved, and it also gives a sense of as I was trying to mention before, maybe a, a nuanced sort of fly on the wall perspective on the one hand, but also kind of uh, intimacy and distance at the same time, which I think is very apropos, the type of purposely applied set of cinematic contradictions that is, I think, uh, hand in hand with uh, Chantal Ackermann's uh, uh, filmography. So uh, I'm very much uh, appreciative of that, those sorts of choices uh, with the presentation that helped to preserve that type of 16 millimeter feel to it. So. Uh, so I'm very impressed uh, with this, and yet, yet another step in this uh, the furtherance of the direction of uh, the Chantal Ackermann journey I uh, hear the uh, Ackermann uh, Slingerbaum journey uh, with respect to this film which is Le Cannes Wheat all right my dear friends so that's it for now but let's keep on going with the Ackermann uh, film discussions so I hope to see you at the next video discussion with respect to this great set uh, Chantal Ackermann masterpieces 1968 to 1978 uh, but until then, or, or whatever the case may be, uh, I very much hope that you continue to be happy and healthy and well, and that you continue to watch a lot of great, great, great movies, including uh, the Kanzuit, including works by Ackermann, including other films in the Criterion Collection, and beyond. Uh, so until the next video, my dear, dear friends, stay strong, stay safe, and cheers. Salut.